day of uh, activity. And uh, we'll start with uh, Luis Agustin Ferreira from uh, Physics San Carlos, who will give the second lecture on hidden symmetries. Please, Luis. Okay. Yours. Okay. Let me share my screen. Um, and then I'll. Uh, okay. Can you see the, the screen? Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you again for the invitation to, to give this talk. So let me start by summarizing uh, what we saw yesterday in the lecture one. Okay, when we ended up uh, with this thing that we have to look for integral equations, right? Involving, um, let's take that's a surface, a volume, a hypervolume. So is a volume ordered integral in this side, and here is a surface uh, ordered integral on the border, right? Um, the reason, uh, well, first of all, this you can interpret as this integral, the volume integral as the charge, and the surface integral as the flux, which is typical in gauge theories, right? But the reason why we conclude that is the following. If you have a, an integral equation like that, and we saw that you can transform the volume in space time in a path in loop space, right? Because for instance, this, if it is a three volume, uh, then you take the loop space from the two dimensional sphere to the, to the space time. So then this volume is a path on the loop space. And the end point is the border of it, okay? Now, the reason why you can do that is that if you change the volume without changing the border, right? Then the right-hand side change, but the left-hand side does not. But since that equation is true for any volume on space-time, uh, it turns out that this red new integral has to be equal to that one on the border but that's equal to this, so these two have to be equal. Therefore, if you change the volume without changing the border, this right-hand side cannot change. So you have um, the path independence. And this, as we saw, and you are going to see more detail now, uh, leads to conservation loss, okay? So that's the idea. So what we need to do that is to construct the, no abelian Stokes theorems, right? So I will start with the usual no abelian Stokes theorem that was first proven, I don't know when, but uh, from what I know was a favor in the 70s. And then there are many other proofs, but I, I'll give a proof that is the one I, we give in the, the paper, okay? Which I think is very simple, okay? Uh, the idea is the following, you, you have a one form connection and you construct the Wilson line through this differential equation. So we saw this yesterday and the general solution, we phrase it as this thing, is a path order exponential integral, right? Of uh, the one form connection, it's the holonomy of this thing. That's the solution. Now, if you vary the, 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 the the trick, the simplest way of proving these theorems I know of is this, you vary the equation, but you vary the, the curve you, uh, you are, I'm taking a closed curve, right? And you vary gamma to gamma plus delta gamma. And then you vary the equation and you get a differential equation for the variation of the Wilson line, okay? You integrate that keeping uh, the initial endpoints equal and no variation there. So you get this equation where F is the curvature of that connection, right? Uh, so what you can think, do now is the following. You take the surface enclosed by the curve. Okay, now I call the gamma is the border of the surface gamma. And you scan it with loops. The loops are parameterized by sigma and I label by tau. So tau equals zero is the infinitesimal loop around XR. 
and tau equals two pi, let's say, is the border of it. Then you can promote this equation you got by varying the, the curve there by a differential equation for the, the same w, but now integrating tau, so integrating over the surface, okay? So you integrate from tau equals zero to tau equals two pi. When you read two pi, you have w for the border, okay? And this, we write it as a surface order integral of this connection. This plays the role of connection now. Like a mu is the connection in the Wilson line. This line, but then uh, we are going to integrate up to two pi, so you get it on the border. So you can calculate the, the Wilson line on the border through the usual Wilson line equation or through this surface integral but they have to be the same. So you get you know, a billion Stokes theorem, which is this, the, the line integral of the connection is the surface integral of the curvature conjugate with the Wilson line. And this Wilson line here that appears is F mu nu is evaluated on some point of the curve. So is the integral of that equation from the reference point to that point where uh, F uh, is being evaluated. So W goes, is integrated from XR up to the point where this F is. So, but this one is integrated on the whole uh, curve, okay? So this theorem is the no abelian version of the usual Stokes theorems we learn in classical mechanics, electromagnetism courses, right? Is this one written in a form, in a one form, uh, way, okay? Now, that's the, this theorem is the one, that's a mathematical theorem, right? It's true for any uh, connection in U and its curvature, right? Um, as long as you don't have holes and handles in your space, you have to modify these when you have that. And, uh, okay. Now we are going to use these Stokes theorems to construct the integral equation because it has the form of our integral equation. So this theorem is relevant for two plus one integral, uh, two plus one field theories, right? So uh, how can you use it to construct uh, conserved quantities? The idea is the following. You take, you scan the surface with loops, then the surface can be seen as a path in loop space, the usual loop space the maps from the circle to the space time, the omega one that I called last uh, talk, right? So then sigma is this path and the border is the end point. So the idea is the same. You vary the surface like a drum, right? You keep the border of the, the surface of the drum uh, fixed and then you vary the surface, right? So this side doesn't change, this should change. But the integral, the, the theorem says it, it has to be true to that one too, because the sigma is the border of sigma prime. Okay, so the theorem holds true here. Then these two things have to be equal. And then you get that this connection, you can see this integral in sigma on the loop of this quantity, w minus one f mu w, as a connection in loop space. And this connection is flat by construction because it's path independent. And the way to see it is this, uh, you integrate this connection on this path, you get the same result by integrating on that one. So if you invert the sense of that uh, path, you get a closed loop. So the, 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 the autonomy of this connection in loop space on a closed loop is zero, is one in fact, right? But then, uh, uh, you can use the Stokes theorems in loop space to show that this uh, integral is the, uh, the surface integral uh, bounded by this closed loop. And that has to be one too. But remember this is one is because everything is exponentiated, right? So then this connection has to be flat, okay? Uh, so the path independence leads to conservation law uh, as we are going to see now, 
and two examples, right? As is the churn Simons in Young Mills in two plus one. Then we are going to do for three plus one uh, theories. Okay. <clears throat> Let's apply then this theorem for the chern simons coupled to matter currents, J ho. So I'm in two plus one dimensions, right? I have uh, the chern simons gauge field, A mu. So that's the physical field of my theory, right? It's going to coincide with the auxiliary field of the non-abelian Stokes theorems in this case, not in the other ones, okay? Um, and then I have this, that's the equation of motion of this chern simon theory. So what I do is I take the non-abelian Stokes theorem and replace F mu nu there by the dual of the current. And I impose this integral equation for any surface here, okay? So that's the integral equation for that model. So that's the differential equation, that's the integral equation. And uh, this equation is a direct consequence of the equations of motion because I took a theorem, which is true for any connection, right? And I replaced the, I, that's a very simple example because I just replaced the curvature by the current here, right? Uh, so the quality now is a consequence of that equation and the non-abelian Stokes theorem, right? So you can interpret that as the charge. In fact, it is the integral on a surface of a current, right? And here's the flux, okay? And when you take the sigma to be infinitesimal and you do Taylor expansion on both sides of this thing, the first non-trivial term is the differential equation of the chern simons theory. So you can obtain the differential equation from the integral equation and vice versa. Okay. Okay, you see that the, the main ingredient is the non-abelian Stokes theorem. Once you have that, things are simple. Okay. Now, the flatness condition is, as I said, uh, is the path independence. And if you take a closed surface without, without border, um, if you don't have border, this side has to be one because this sigma is zero, right? So this integral here is one on a closed surface. So that's what I have here. I have a closed surface. Now, a closed surface in loop space is a closed loop, right? What you do is the, the, the lonomy of the, that connection, this connection in loop space, right, is one. But if you break the closed loop in two curves, right, sigma one and sigma two, you can integrate on sigma one and integrate in sigma two. So you, you section that equation into two parts, but then you inverse, you take the inverse of sigma two and put on the other side. And then you get that these two integral are the same. So the integral from here to there and from there to here is the same. So that's the path independence. Now let's look for the construction of the charge in space time. I have done it to simplify things on um, loop space, but let's come down to space time. So I'm in two plus one dimension. So time is on the vertical axis and space is on the horizontal plane, right? So I take a cylinder, right? I'll, at the end, I'll take this, the, the radius of this cylinder to infinity, right? So I scan, uh, the surface with loops as usual. So here is my space in time t equals zero. So I scan it, okay? And that's the surface sigma one. And uh, I, I, what I'll do, since my connection is flat, I can integrate through two endpoints uh, with different surface, right? So the first surface is the one I start from XR, the infinitesimal thing here. I integrate over the, the space, the bottom of the cylinder. When I reach the, the border of it, I rise in time, okay? Until I get that border there at time equals T. So my surface, it starts with this border here there, 
and the infinitesimal thing here. So is the side of the cylinder and the bottom of it, right? Now, the other one is I take an infinitesimal loop here around X here. Instead of scanning the surface at t equals zero, I rise in time first, and then I scan it at time equals t, right? So these two integrals have to be equal due to my integral equation. So I have this. First, I integrate on the on the, the disk with this one, and then I rise in time, which is this integral, is a surface integral. On the second surface, I integrate on the infinitesimal cylinder here, and then on the same surface as this one by time equals t. So this surface, the same as this at different times. So this one and that one are integrated on the same physical surface at different times. Now, I take the following boundary condition. The dual of the current, which is the density, should fall as one over R square plus delta, R two plus delta. Delta is, can be infinitesimal, head, but cannot be zero, right? For large R. If you impose this boundary condition, it's sufficient for this integral here on the border to vanish, right? And this is infinitesimal, so it vanishes too. So it's one here, one there. But the point is, this one is based on the reference point xr, and that integral there is also on this xr. So what I do, I will transport this reference point from time t equals zero to time t equals t, because I want to scan the surface with reference points on its border at that time, okay? So if I do that, I, uh, I get that the integral time equals t is conjugated by the Wilson line because when I transport the reference point, it's the Wilson line that transport it, all right? So then I have an isospectral evolution of this operator, okay? And then the eigenvalues of it are constant in time. So my charge will be the eigenvalues of this operator which is the integral of the dual of the current conjugate with the Wilson line on space, on the space, the R square, right? The plane R2, okay? Which I call it the disk of infinite radius here, right? But my integral equation says that this thing is the integral of the connection on the border on the circle with the infinite radius at the border of the, the plane. So I can calculate the operator that gives the charge either as a line, uh, a loop integration or a surface integration, right? They are equal by now our um, integral equation. So this is the, the charge of the Chern-Simons theory, okay? They are the eigenvalues of the holonomy of the physical gauge field of the Chern-Simons theory. Uh, on the circle at infinity. If you do this at different times, the eigenvalues will be the same. They don't change, okay? Now, if you go to two plus, uh, to Yang Mills in two plus one dimension, you use the same theorems, but I call now a calligraph because the connection that appears on the Stokes theorems will not be the physical gauge field, all right? It will be different, not in Chern Simon is the simplest example, but it, in Young Mills is a bit uh, more involved. So, what I'll do, I'll take the one form that appears in this Snobbillian Stokes theorems to be the gauge field of my Young Mills theory in two plus one dimension, plus a constant, which is arbitrary, times the dual of the curvature tensor. And two plus one, so the, the dual of the curvature tensor is a vector. Right, is a screw vector in time, in fact. Okay, then that's what I take as my connection in the abelian Stokes theorem. Then I calculate the curvature of this connection, a calligraph, which involves these two quantities, and I plug it there, right? And what I get is this, is this integral equation, okay? 
is the, the loop integral of the gauge field plus a constant times the dual of the curvature, right? And then um, the, the curvature of that connection, which is the curvature of a mu plus the dual of the current and this commutator between the two duals, right? Conjugate as usual with the Wilson line element. So that's my integral equation for Yang mu's in two plus one dimension, right? If I take the border to zero, I recover the Yang mu's equations in two plus one dimension, which is this one, right? Mm -hmm. One follows from the other, okay? Uh, one comment is that this beta is arbitrary. In the Yang mu's in three, in three plus one, there will be two parameters. Um, we, 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 have, we don't understand yet the role of this beta, right? But uh, mathematically, it resembles what people do in loop quantum gravity, that they shift the connection by uh, the do of some curvature, okay? And it's very similar, but mathematically, not physically. It's totally different from the physical point of view. Uh, so the conserved charts are calculated the same way as change signals, right? It's going to be uh, the eigenvalues of this operator on the S1 at infinite or the same operator integrate on the plane, right? So this will be our uh, conserved charge. So this example is more non-trivial because the structure is much more involved. In fact, it has this parameter there. Okay, so uh, this is usual non abelian Stokes theorems uh, can be used in two plus one dimension for field theories to construct the, the integral equations. Now, the question is what do you do in three plus one dimension? So let's ask Mr. Holmes how do we find the integral equation in three plus one? And his answer is ask Professor Maxwell, okay? So let's have a look in Maxwell theory and get the insight from that, okay? That's very important. And also it's a physical theory. So uh, I'll take the Maxwell's equation, right? Let's, let's learn how you do it, okay? So as usual, you write the Maxwell's equations in terms of the, uh, tensors, the four tensors and the four vectors, right? So this small j is the current, the four current, the density rho and the, the space current. And these are the Maxwell's equations. And uh, since F mu nu is anti-symmetric, if you take the divergence of this side, you, you reach the conclusion that this current is conserved. So the charge in Maxwell theory is the integral of J zero, which is the integral of divergence of Fi zero, which is the electric field. So is the, the, the flux of the electric field on the border of that volume. So that's the electric charge, that's Gauss law, right? That's the usual thing. Now, how do you construct the integral equations for Maxwell theory? Because Maxwell electromagnetism, electrodynamics started with integral equations, right? So you learn these things in your electromagnetism course in physics three and so on. But let me phrase it in a way that's not usual in the textbooks, right? So the relevant abelian, uh, the, the relevant Stokes theorem is the abelian Stokes theorem for a two form connection, right? Is this B mu nu here. And uh, the way I wrote here is the following. You take a three volume, so take, think of this as a ball, right? Then you scan the ball with bubbles, right? Labeled by zeta. And then each bubble is scanned by loops, labeled by tau, and parameterized by sigma, okay? That's a way of ordering the integration. Here, the, the, the ordering is not important because everything is a billion. So at the end of the day, you don't need this ordering. But I'm doing the ordering because I'll need this in Young Mills. So I'll phrase things in Maxwell theory to resemble already what I'm going to do 
in, in young males. So that's the usual uh, Stokes theorems. Not, not the usual, the, the usual one is the one I talked before, uh, but that's the Stokes theorem for a two-form connection. So what you do is take this Stokes theorem, right? And use Maxwell's equation and take B mu nu to be a linear combination of the curvature and the dual of the curvature, okay? And you replace it in the abelian Stokes theorem. But when you replace, you get that the, co the exterior covariant derivative of F is zero, but the exterior covariant derivative of F dual is the dual of the current. So here you have the exterior covariant of B, but B is the linear combination of F and that's the integral equation for Maxwell's equation, which is the usual ones, but written in this form with linear combinations and so on to make it more compact. Physically, we don't have anything different from the usual uh, uh, integral equation, just to phrase it in a different way. So then you play the same trick, right? Because you have the integral on a volume and the integral on a border. So if you make the border equals to zero, that's integral it has to be zero, right? So that's what I'm going to do. I take the border of the volume to be zero. So a volume without border, you have to go to four dimensions to see this, right? You can't see a three volume without border in three dimensions. It's like the, the surface of a drum, right? If you want to change the surface without changing border, you, have, you need a third dimension, right? The same is true here. So we need a four dimension to visualize this. So, but that's the thing, if this, Border is zero, this integral is zero. So that one has to be zero by the integral equations, right? So what you do uh, here is the same thing I did in Chern Simons, but now the cylinder is one dimension higher. So the bottom of it is a volume, not a disc, it's a ball. So think of this, bo this bottom as to be your room where you are now, okay? So you choose a corner of your room, okay? and uh, you stick to it uh, a bubble, right? And you scan your room with this, you inflate this balloon. You take a balloon, fix at this corner of your room, and then you inflate it. So the balloon, you scan your room until it reaches the, the walls, the ceiling, the floor, and so on. Then it's stuck to all these walls, right? So you have scanned. it. So when you do that, you are scanning and integrating here, which is J zero because you are in space, right? So you get the charge inside your room at time equals zero. Then you rise, this, this balloon is still stuck to the walls, but now you switch on the chrono, chronometer and then the time starts running. So your room is rised in time, okay? And you integrate, but if, your room is big enough, the, the density of charge at the walls is zero. So this integral is zero, right? Then reach the times t equals t, and then you disinflate the balloon. And then you are going to scan your room backwards, right? And the balloon is disinflating, okay? So you are doing that integral, but in the reverse sense. So you get minus the charge inside your room, at time equals t. And when the balloon has disinflated, you come back in time to time equals zero. And that's again is zero. So you get the conservation of electric charge, right? That's another way of seeing the conservation of the electric charge using the integral equations, right? Uh, that's why I'm phrasing all these things just to fix the notation that we are going to need for young mills, right? So that's another way. Now the path independence is the same story. You take the integral equation, the volume is a path in this loop space, right? From the maps from S2 to N, the border is the end point, the reference point is the initial point, right? And again, you vary the volume without varying the border, and then you get another integral on the right-hand side which has to be equal to that one because you have charge at the border. And then this connection in loop space, which the integral of the dual of the current, there is no use online here because everything is a billion, it's flat, 
right? Because it's path independent, okay? So this thing is zero because it's a billion. So the commutator term of that connection loop space vanishes because it's a billion. And the exterior derivative in loop space is Maxwell's equation that comes from uh, action principle, not the Bianchi identity, is this one, okay? So the flatness of this thing in loop space is a consequence of Maxwell's equation. So you are phrasing the loss of electrodynamics in terms of a flat connection in loop space, okay? So you can say that Maxwell theory correspond to a flat connection in loop space. What do you get with this? Nothing, because Maxwell theory is completely solved. There is nothing new physically to be done, but it's another way of looking at it, which will be relevant for the unmills. Okay, that's what, what I'm saying. Okay, so that's what Mr. Holm told us, learn from uh, Maxwell's okay, theory. So you are just rephrasing things here. So let's go to Young Mills. That's what I have promised you to do. So uh, I'm talking about the Young Mills itself, right? Without supersymmetry, but with matter currents. So these currents can be the spinor currents under transform under some representation frame right? in QCD. These are the quarks and the triplet and the anti-quarks and the anti-triplet. Or if you take the weinberg salin this is the doublet of the left-handed fermions in the singlets of the right-handed fermions, right? And the Higgs field, you can have scalar fields too here, add to the currents, right? So these currents contain everything, okay? And then you have the curvature. And the, the thing is that uh, the, the covariant derivative here is used in the adjoint representation because the F transforms under the adjoint. But there is one thing I want to call your attention. The spinors transforms under any representation of the gauge group. But when you write the currents that appear in this equation, it's a Lie algebra element because you get the generator TA that makes the current JA, J mu A, but you contract with your generator of the Lie algebra, then it becomes a Lie algebra. So this current transforms under the adjunct by conjugation, okay? which is the same as the this size transforming under the R representation, okay? I'm going to use that. The currents, when written in terms of a Lie algebra element, transforms by conjugation, okay? That will be important in our calculations. So uh, a comment about the conserved charge of young mills theories that you find in textbooks, right? What you do is the following. The, the young mills equations are these, that's the Bianca identity, right? And that's the young mills equation itself. So what you do, you take the commutator term and pass to the right-hand side and you are left with the ordinary derivative of F mu nu, right? Uh, so what you have, that's the young mills equation with the commutator put on the other side. And I call that small j. This small j is not, a, is not the matter currents. It's just the divergence of f mu nu, okay? But since f mu nu is um, anti-symmetric, like in the Maxwell theory, the divergence of it is zero. So that's how you get an electric conserved current in Ian Mills. If you take the Bianca identity, you put the commutator on the other side, you have a J tilde current, which is the magnet current, and the divergence of it is also zero. You can get that to the Noether's theorem too, but it's a bit trickier. It's simpler to get it directly from the young mills equations, right? So you have two conserved currents. And look that notes that this J lies in the Lie algebra. So the number of currents here is the dimension of the, the gauge group, okay? Now the charge, are these ones. It's the same as in Maxwell theory, right? Is the integral, the space integral of the time component of the current, which is the density, which is the divergence of F10. But this is by Gauss law in the flux of the non-abelian electric field. So the number of conserved charge you have here 
electric charge is the dimension of the gauge group. These are non-abelian charge. And the magnetic charge is the same, is the flux of the magnetic field. So you have dimension G, magnetic charge conserved. Okay, that's what Young Mills did in their original paper, but they called attention that if you make a gauge transformation, the electric field being the component of the field tensor it transforms under the adjoint. So it transforms by conjugation. And this integral is on a surface at the spatial infinity, right? So the G doesn't have to be constant on that surface. So you cannot take it out of the integral. So this thing is not gauge invariant, okay? So the electric and magnetic charge that you find in textbooks, they are not gauge invariant. In fact, Steve Weinberg in his book makes a comment about that. Uh, many people try to circumvent these problems, you see, to find a way of getting uh, gauge invariant charge. You see, Jakif has a review paper that discussed this problem. Okay, so it's a problem in um, non-abelian gauge theories, not only in our daily thing. The, the point is, um, the problem here is the same problem that Einstein had when he formulated uh, special relativity. Who cares about it? Because the labs don't move with respect to the other at the speeds close to the speed of light. So you don't have to make uh, transformation from one reference frame to the other, the where this, the, the velocity is that big. So the fastest thing that they had down that time was the trains, which is 100 kilometers an hour at most. So special relativity was not important for the experimentalist, right? And the same thing is here. The, the charge, the non-abelian charge we have are the non-abelian charge from QCD, which are confined, and the non-abelian charge of the electroweak theory, which are shorthand, very shorthand uh, uh, interactions, right? So in the labs, they don't make much difference, right? So, uh, but if you impose G to be constant and infinite, you can take it out of the integral and then G transforms under conjugation, like the electric field. So the eigenvalues are getting back. So you have rank G, gauge invariant quantities and not dimension G, if you restrict yourself to this case. We have a question. <clears throat> yes, Tiago? Oh, sorry. Oh. Luis, but uh, charge conservation comes from global symmetries, right? You have, uh, of course, you have U1 local, but we also have U1 global. And from that, we, we derive charge yeah, conservation. That, not... That's a good question, because as I said, you. You can get this from Noether's theorem, but it's trickier. And the reason is this, that the Noether theorem is valid for global symmetries. When the symmetries are local, there is what they call the second Noether's theorem that just says that the system has constraints, right? And that's what happens in lateral dynamics. So when the, 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 the symmetry is local, right? you have the second theorem that just says that you have constraints. You don't get conserved charge from that. But you can play tricks. That's why I say it's trickier. Okay, let's make the, 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 the symmetry global, forget the local ones and see what we get. You can get this charge playing with the Nettler's theorem there if the mathemat mathematicians are not watching you, right? I don't know if that's your question. <clears throat> Tiago. Uh, not really. Uh, my point is that since the, uh, the gauge symmetries are purely local, we don't have to do this, this game, right? In the sense that the, the charges, these uh, non-gauge invariant charges are not observable. So they don't, they don't need to be conserved in the usual sense. Well, I don't know. I'm going to show you gauge invariant charts which are observable in a moment. In a, oh, okay, okay. Um, you see, in QCD, this charge will not be observed because of confinement, 
right? But if you add enough matter fields, you know that the, the data function chain sign, for instance, in QCD, if you have more than 16 families of quarks, the beta function flip signs, you don't have uh, asymptotic freedom anymore. So then they, they, are not char they are not confined anymore and these charges will be observable, okay? Uh, you have to be careful about this thing. Uh, what I'm pointing here, uh, these charges are not, they are not, it is not that they are not observable, they don't make sense because they are gauge dependent. You change the gauge, they change. That's what I'm saying. Oh, what, what I'm trying to understand is the following, that these, these charges that you derive, they generate an algebra that's related to the, to the gauge symmetry, right? These charges. And that's it. They, they make this charge. Then the, there is this Nutter theorem that says for each global symmetry of the field theory, we have, we can derive a conserved charge. But this is not global symmetry, this is local. So you, you don't need to, to, to make these guys, these charges uh, look, observable look. sets. A anyway, you, you can keep, we can have this discussion. discussion. Forget Nutter's theorem. Just take the, the equations of motion at face value, <laughs> what I did here. So the divergence of these currents are zero. So if you have proper boundary condition, they are conserved. No one can, can uh, say this is wrong. You see, you have that. Uh, there, there is no I, I'm, I'm not saying that's wrong. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand the game behind this. What about if we leave this for the discussion? Yes, uh, yes, uh, yes, I agree. We should. Uh, Thiago. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, Luis is not going to finish in 15 minutes. <laughs> Okay, now uh, let's go to non-abelian gauge theories. And now we need a Stokes theorem. This Stokes theorem is a, like we did for Maxwell's theory, involves a two-form connection. So for a billion two-form connection, the theorem is known, right? You find it in any uh, books on differential geometry, right? Now, the no abelian case was not known. So we built this theorem something like 20 years ago, right? And it goes like this. It's the same idea as the usual no abelian Stokes theorem. You take a surface, because the integral is going to be over surface, not a loop now, right? And uh, you scan it with loops as usual, labeled by tau, parameterized by sigma, and you define a Wilson surface equation here, where you have here the two form connection and you have to conjugate it with the Wilson line for a one form connection. So you need two quantities here, the rank two tensor, the two form connection and the vector, the one form connection. So you integrate over a loop, right? And this is my connection for this integral here over the surface. That's the differential equation I impose. Then I got V for any surface by integrating this equation. And I get a surface order integral, which I write it like that. Okay. But it's quite simple to, to make, write down the series that solves this equation. And this VR is an integration constant, right? It's because of first order differential equation. Now it's the same thing. You take the surface and vary it. And you go there and vary the equation and obtain an equation for the variation of V, okay? And what you get is this. Okay, you get an equation integrated and then you get the variation of V times the inverse of it is an integral like in sigma because I had it already. And then you integrate in tau. And what you get is this. I'm using this notation that upper script W is a conjugation by W, the Wilson line, right? So I have a first term, which is just one sigma integral, which is the exterior covariant derivative of B. And here is the commutator. But it's a commutator of B minus F with B, everything conjugate with W. But the W that conjugate this one is integrate up to sigma. And the W conjugate is integrate up to sigma prime. So two different points in loop, in the loop, is cutting the surface, right? So the idea is the same. 
you promote this to differential equation in a new parameter zeta that labels the surface now. So now I take uh, a closed surface. This equation is too true for the variation of closed surface, right? And then I integrate over a volume and get V on the border. And then I get the non-abelian Stokes theorem that this thing is integrating zeta, right? Which is that kappa, which is the same thing I had before, right? And this is integrated over tau, which is the, the, the surface. So this thing has to be equal. And that's the uh, non-abelian Stokes theorem for uh, a two-form connection. When B is abelian, this commutes with W, so it disappears W here. All this commutator drops, and this covariant derivative is just the ordinary derivative, and you are back to the abelian Stokes theorem I had in Maxwell's theory, right? So it's really a generalization of that one. And this you can see as a flat connection in this loop space because of that thing I told you. If you vary the volume without varying the border, you reach the conclusion that this is a flat connection. So the integral equations of Young Mills is replaced B mu nu, like we did in Maxwell, by the linear combination of F, the, the curvature, and the dual of the curvature. Right? You plug it there and plug it on the other side and use Young Mills equation. Right? So it's a direct consequence of this Stokes theorem and the Young Mills equation. I have used nothing else. Right? And if I take the limit where the volume goes to zero, right, I, um, I get back the young Mills equation in first order. When I Taylor expand both sides, this and take the first term is the young Mills equation. The other terms are higher derivatives equations which follow from the young Mills equations, right? Okay, that's the integral equation for young Mills, okay? Um, okay, that's what I, we did in uh, almost 10 years ago, right? This is a page that is on my student, Gabriel Lucchini, all right? Uh, and now they conserve charge. So the idea is the same. You take a closed volume, all right, without border. So this right-hand side is one. And you do the same thing as we did in Maxwell. You take that cylinder where the bottom is a ball, a three-dimensional ball. You integrate over the volume at time t equals zero. You get this in, the integral of that thing on your room at time t equals zero. Then you rise in time and you get this integral on the border. Then you scan back your room at time equals t and you get this integral. And then you bring back the, the balloon uh, to time t equals one, t equals zero, sorry. So the product of these four integrals is one, right? But you impose boundary conditions such that this is one and that is one. But again, there is this thing that the, the reference point has to be transported to that time cos t because you want to scan the surface with the reference point at time cos t, not the time cos zero. So this brings a Wilson line conjugating this operator. And so you have an isospectral evolution. This V of omega t is the inverse of this integral. I, you, you, because I'm scanning backwards, right? Um, then uh, you have to reverse the order of the scanning to get that. And this V omega zero is exactly this integral here. So the space volume order integral evolves in time in this way. So the eigenvalues of this operator are constant. So these are my charts the conserved charge of Young Mills, right? The eigenvalues of this operator are constant in time and they are my charge. But look, uh, these charges they are gauge invariant. Um, the point is I have the conjugation with W, right? I think here I have to make a comment because I'll use the, 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 my blackboard. Uh, is the following. The F transforms by, can you see my, my thing, my this thing? And the Wilson line on a curve, so let's take this XR and that's X. 
it transforms like this is g of x uh, w g minus one of x r. That's like how the Wilson line transforms. Is the g at the end point and the inverse of g at the initial point. So if you take w minus one f w, it transforms like g at x r w minus one f w g minus one x r <clears throat> because um, the g of this w cancels that g and then when I bring back the inverse here it cancels the other so I'm left with the g at the reference point but this reference point is constant in my integral equation so I hide the local gauge symmetry of young mills in the integral equations in a global symmetry, right? This has nothing to do with Noether's theorem. It's just to make uh, my uh, equation, right, gauging covariant. Because if I didn't have the conjugation with W here, in this integral equation, look, everything is conjugated with W here. And everything transformed on the local thing by conjugation. So all these quantity have a global symmetry, not local ones. Then you can bring back, bring out of the integration, this G at the reference point. And then the equation, the integral equation transforms under local gauge transformations covariantly by conjugation and the element at the reference point, okay? So uh, then, the charge transforms like the operator that gives the charge transforms like this. So the eigenvalues are gauge invariant for any gauge transformation. If it's constant or not at infinite, these are gauge invariant. The number of them is the rank of the group, not the, okay, the number is a point to discuss. I, I'll come, because you have these alphas and betas here, and that's a tricky point. Another thing is that if you change the reference point, this operator changes by conjugation, so the eigenvalues don't change. Now, my connection is flat. So if you change the parameterization of the volume, this is changing the path in loop space, but my connection is flat in loop space, so it doesn't change. So the parameterization problem that I had before in yesterday in the, my talk is disappeared. Everything is invariant under reparameterization. This is one of the biggest progress that this approach does. Because everything in loop space that you know of have this problem of reparameterization. Because at the end of the day, the physics has to be independent of reparameterization. And uh, that's a problem, but which is solved now in a quite simple and elegant way. And then you get uh, non-trivial dynamic magnetic charge for the monopoles. Right, which I got. And then, uh, okay, this I, I will discuss in a moment for the global aspects of things. Now, let me give you a simple example, right? Um, if you take the Tuf Polyakov and Wu Yang monopoles for SU2, right? Uh, because what happens in my thing is that I can calculate the charge either by a volume or a surface, but this surface is at infinite. Right, So it's easier to calculate the integral on the surface at infinite. So I need the, the solution at infinite only. And at infinite, these two solutions look the same. I mean, the, the, the gauge field for the Tuft Polyakov and Nivu Young uh, are the same. Note that the Tuft Polyakov has the Higgs field, the Wu Young does not. But my integral equation, coming back here, this surface integral doesn't involve the Higgs field. The Higgs field is inside this thing. It appears on the volume integral. So the Higgs field will contribute to the volume integral in the, the, the truth polyakov and not in the Wu Yang because it's not there. But the surface integral is the same for both. That's an important thing, okay? Uh, the surface integral has to be the same for both because the gauge field at infinite is the same. 
So the magnetic field or the dual vector, which is this one, is the same. Now, the important thing, and this is very important, right, is that this R is the unit vector in the radial direction. It has three components, but my algebra is SU2, so it has three dimensions, two. So I can contract the group indices with the space indices and make this a scalar product, R scalar T. Now, if you take the derivative respect to sigma on a loop, right, of this quantity, W minus one R squared T, and use the Wilson line equation, right, you get the covariant derivative of this quantity contract with the tangent vector to the loop, okay? But this quantity is covariantly constant at infinity, which is this. You can, it's a simple calculation. Take this quantity R scalar T and calculate the covariant derivative with this connection. You get zero. Okay. So this is zero, and that therefore this derivative is zero. This means that this, quant this quantity is constant along the loop. So it has the same value it has at the reference point, which I'll call TR. So I have the unit vector at my reference point pointing in some direction. This choose a Lie algebra element. I'll call it TR, right? So then the surface integral is simple because it is the flux of this conjugated magnetic field. So, but then it becomes a billion. By a magic, it becomes a billion. So the integral doesn't need ordering because now it's just the exponential of this integral. The constant Lie algebra element comes out of the integral. This R square cancels with R square from the surface uh, element, all right? And then you have an integral on the angles which gives four pi, all right? And times this constant element. And alpha is this alpha that I use in the linear combination of alpha and F, dual, F and F dual, right? So these the eigenvalues of this operator are the my conserved quantities. Right, and they are the same for the truth Polyakov and Wu Yang, and they are not zero. If you calculate the textbook charge I told you, which is this one without conjugate with W, it's a very simple exercise, it's zero. So the Wu Yang monopole doesn't have a topological charge because it doesn't have Higgs field, and it didn't have a dynamically conserved magnetic charge either because it was zero. The textbook charge is zero. So it was a monopole without a magnetic charge. And that was a problem because people didn't know if the Wu Yang monopole needed a source or not to be a solution because this, the, the field is singular at the origin. It's a one over R square magnetic field all over space, right? Now, the tooth polyakov monopole had the topological magnetic charge, which is the mapping from the, as this is here as two, to um, the Higgs vacuum, right? So uh, it, it does have that, but it, it didn't have a dynamically conserved magnetic charge. Now it has both, right? And they are the same because the two monopoles look the same at infinity. They have to have the same magnetic charge, okay? Um, another thing is, um, if you take beta equals zero, uh, and then you are left only with alpha, so the surface integral is linear in alpha here, but it's not the volume. So you get a, a quantity here, which is this commutator, when you take beta equals zero. Uh, and this plays the role of a density of magnetic charge for the tooth polyakov monopole. So the density of magnetic charge, of density of this dynamically conserved magnetic charge is this commutator. So the non-abelian character of the theory is what brings the density of magnetic charge. The Wu Yang monopole does not have it because this commutator vanishes. I'll come it in a second. Now, so you can read off the magnetic charge from this equation. But if you take alpha equals one, this right-hand side is one. And then you get the quantization of the magnetic charge. So you get a quantization that doesn't come from topology. 
is a dynamically conserved magnetic charge, which is conserved and it's quantized because of the uh, Bianca identity, the integral Bianca identity for alpha equals one. Um, so uh, for the Vujian monopole, that C equals zero. And then comes the problem. Now you have a non-trivial flux at infinite and at inside. So it can't be, you see, it doesn't match because my equation is flux equals to charge, but the charge is zero because C is zero. So how comes? So we made a very careful analysis of this thing, right? And we have a paper, which is in JPA two years ago, and the Vu-Yang uh, monopole is not a solution of the young Mu's equations, okay? Uh, you need an external source to make it a solution, and the source is this one. This delta is the radial part of the Dirac delta function, the three-dimensional Dirac delta function. So what appears here is not the Dirac delta function in three dimensions, but only the radial part of it, which is delta of r over r squared. And then appears that funny element, which is r scalar t, and one over e, which is characteristic of the magnetic charge, right? So the Bianca identity is not zero, but it is not zero in a, in, on a domain of uh, measure zero, zero measure, right? So in terms of distribution theory, in the sense of distribution theory, the Bianca identity is satisfied because the distribution associated to this is zero, right? That's a funny and subtle thing that you don't break Bianca identity in the distribution theory sense, but you do have a source in, in a domain of zero measure, right? Now, another thing is that I'm running out of time. Um, as I said, you can expand both sides of this equation. And in fact, what you have is an infinite number of integral equations because you have to match the uh, given power of alpha here with a given power on the other side. So you have an infinite number of integral equations. And you have checked this for the truth polyakov monopole and this infinite, we have checked up to second order. But if you look at the calculation, you convince yourself that it has to be satisfied in all orders. Um, so uh, the equation, even though you have an infinite number of uh, integral equation, the truth polyakov monopole solution that satisfies it. For the Vuyang monopole, now you have to use this charge because this we did in 2018, the source of the monopole in 19. So we haven't done this calculation for the Vuyang monopole yet, okay? Now there is a, I'll skip this SU3, you can do it in any uh, gauge group. You can take monopole solution in H gauge group and calculate this charge, right? And in the case of SU3, uh, the, the interesting thing is that the charge is insensitive to the pattern of symmetry breaking. That's amazing. So if you take SU3, you can break it in U1 cross U1 or SU2 cross U1. The topological charge of the monopoles change, but our dynamical charge don't. So that's something to be understood. Our magnetic charge doesn't depend upon the pattern of symmetry breaking. Right? So it's dynamically conserved, not topological, it's quantized, and doesn't depend upon the Higgs, in fact. Right? Okay, and the last thing I want to say is this is something to think further. Okay, is the following. Um, as I said, the volume integral, right, uh, is the integral of. Uh, it's like a, a three form connection, like this the dual, the current, and these things, and it's path independent. So, this connection in loop space must be flat for the autonomy of this connection to be path independent in loop space. So, we can phrase the dynamics of ordinary Young Mills theory as the flatness of a con connection in loop space. And that's the connection. It's very complicated, but that's it, okay? It involves these two 
uh, um, these two um, arbitrary parameters, right? Which we, we have to understand. But the thing is, in loop space, you can make gauge transformations on this connection. And these are symmetries of this equation because the, the right hand side is zero. There is nothing to conjugate here, all right? So it's invariant. This equation is invariant under this gauge transformation. So these are hidden symmetries of ordinary gauge symmetries. It's symmet are hidden symmetries of QCD, are hidden symmetries of the electric weinberg salan theory, is the hidden symmetries of any gauge theory, right? Uh, and then uh, what you have is to understand better this thing. This is something we are working on. Uh, a naive guess for this group element is this thing. Is the, the parameters of the group are these tensors, beta mu nu and alpha mu, right? They perhaps valued on the Lie algebra, right? The algebraic structure behind this is not clear yet. But I that's include, Louis. Sorry. <laughs> yes, and so these are the hidden symmetries of the thing. Okay, and uh, the, as I said, the conserved charge are the holonomy of this connection loop space, and it connects to integrable theory, even though this theory might not be integrable. Okay, um, in the sense of having infinite number of conserved quantities. So. The important symmetries for many nonlinear phenomena are not the third type. They are of this hidden type, okay? I talked about from Newtonian mechanics to uh, gauge theory, non-abelian gauge theory. And the path independence is the important concept because it leads to the Isaac spectral evolution and to the conservation law. It connects to soliton theory in two dimensions. So it connects gauge theory to integrable theories in one plus one dimension. Um, and there is some very interesting structure to understand here. And so after 60 years, we have the integral equations for young mills theory, because young mills start like Maxwell theory in terms of differential equations. The integral equation was never constructed, so it was constructed. And we solved this problem of the uh, integral, uh, the, the gauge invariant conserved charge, okay? So we hope that it paved the way to some new developments. So here are the references, the main references for the talk. And that's it. Thank you.